Hi, everyone. My name is Georgina Paskogan, and I'm the co-founder of Final Bath Yellow Face, and I just want to welcome you to What's the Tea? Um, it's a daily conversation with a dancer of Asian descent during the month of May to celebrate Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And today, as our special guest, I'm super excited about this, is Miss Stella Abrera from a ABT. And um, Stella, hi. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having having me um can you talk about we are asking for donations and we want to give every dancer a chance to shout out who they're raising money for so do you want to take a minute right at the start and then i'll be sure to leave a link in our comments wonderful thank you i'm so grateful to be included uh this is a wonderful opportunity um for us to help our dance organizations um, who are struggling during this time, as are many organizations, um, but two that I feel very close to, um, close to my heart. Uh, yes, I am from ABT, and I've been a ballerina at ABT for 24 years. Um, I am also uh, the artistic director of Kotspon Cultural Park for Dance in Tivoli, New York. And so I would love to raise money for both organizations, COVID crisis relief funds. Um, both organizations are working tirelessly to keep their staff employed and survive this difficult time um so i'm i'm very grateful to you for this oppor opportunity to raise money for them absolutely of course so let's just jump right in it's been i both you and i in our careers have never experienced anything like this um i'm sure we've all had in the shows due to like injury but <laughs> not due to a global pandemic. So could you um, just kind of fill the viewers in on what are you missing right now? Um, like what had, what were you looking forward to during the ABT season? But just in general, it could be anything. Like what, how has this affected you? Well, obviously my heart goes out to all the people on the front lines who are risking their lives to keep us all safe. Um, I, my heart breaks thinking of all the people who have lost loved ones and the scope of this is so massive. I just wanna, to, wanted to say something to that before I go into what I feel um, I'm missing out on uh, artistically uh, on a personal level. This year was, is, a monumental year for me at ABT in that it was my final um, season. So I was slated to retire uh, at the Metropolitan Opera House in June with Giselle. And um, obviously all of our winter and spring tours were affected. Um, I had planned on saying goodbye to many dear theaters in several shows uh, in the last couple of months. And I was really looking forward to uh, saying goodbye to the Metropolitan Opera House stage in some iconic roles that I cherish, such as Juliet and Giselle. Um, I do think of that and I obviously, um feeling loss but i also am able to turn it around and think about gosh how lucky i am to have had those 24 years of enjoying my career uh, and everything that came with it all the the triumphs and the challenges so that's what i'm missing right now the chance to say the proper chance to say goodbye but i am also reflective um during this 
this quiet time at home um, gives me a chance to reflect on just the magnitude and the magnitude of <sighs> the years I, I put into the career and how grateful I am to have had the privilege to, to do it. Thank you so much for that. I mean, this is why I just respect and admire you so much. Um, you have such a beautiful heart and you have a understanding that it's not what we do is not just on the stage and we've given our lives to this beautiful art form to um inspire people and you have always done that and it breaks my heart to hear you say that you might not have a chance to give a, a concrete uh, farewell in the way that we anticipated all celebrating you but I just I I want you to know at least from my perspective that I I, I think that's it, it's absolutely valid to be feeling that loss and to to sit in that that you have a career that is so wonderful and should be celebrated and I'm sure we're going to find a way to celebrate you um, oh, in the you. way you should That's be. Very very so. Thank you. Um, so let's flip it back to the beginning. And um, can you tell <laughs> uh, the viewers what made you um, start dance training? Yeah, my sister is, uh, I have, I'm, I'm the youngest of five children. Mm -hmm. um, the other four siblings are much older than me. And my eldest sister was already in college when I was five years old and she loved dance. She took modern dance classes uh, at college and she saw me watching cartoons one day, just being a total couch potato and said, this is not good. Let's get you off the couch and and to the local ballet school and i did and i it was i was totally in my element like immediately so i would say from day one at age five i started um taking regular ballet lessons and just progressed and was completely obsessed by the age of 10 and knew that it was for me I love that. I, I resonate with that experience as well. Like having it just hit right off the bat. Like, what is this? I love this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, I just, and I also, I didn't know that you were one of five. I'm one of six. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. Where, where are it. you? I'm straight up middle child. Can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just always <laughs> clamoring for attention. Can you enlighten our viewers um, a little bit? What is your ethnic background, your cultural heritage, and to what degree are you connected to it? I'm a Filipino heritage. Love it. And to what degree am I connected to my heritage? Well, uh, I, I identify as Filipino American, identify as an American. Um, I'm very proud of my Filipino heritage. I've, my parents definitely educated me in, in its his, the history of the culture and the country. Um, I've been privileged to visit the country often especially as a child. Um, I'm, and now as an adult, I'm very grateful to feel the connection to the country in that um, I've been able to create charities and also be connected to charities for children's education in the Philippines. In 2014, I created a charity called Steps Forward for the Philippines. Um, I connected it to a gig I had uh, at uh, Ballet Philippines. I was invited to 
to perform. And um, right after I was invited, that enormous monumental uh, typhoon hit, Typhoon Haiyan, and just devastated the central Filipino islands. Um, so I was able to uh, partner with an organization called Operation USA, and my organization helped rebuild a school, an elementary school that had been just completely flattened. So I was able to go visit that school when it was in its final stages of construction and a whole like maybe 30 really young, super sweet Filipino children came to welcome me to their almost reopened school and they sang songs for me and they held up little signs saying thank you miss stella and i basically cried my eyeballs out for the whole visit because it was so sweet and so moving um so to have it had been quite a long time since i had visited the philippines um before that time felt like a nice um kind of reconnection to the country of my heritage. So a few years later, it was so wonderful that I was able to connect to an organization called Centex, Center for Excellence. Um, they, these are schools in the Philippines uh, built expressly for gifted children who come from disadvantaged economic backgrounds. What's amazing is that uh, this organization also partners with a ballet school or a dance school in Manila, uh, who I am closely related uh, with called STEPS. And um, many Filipino students have come to Katsban, a uh, summer intensive program from Centex and from Steps in the Philippines. Um, to, so to have that cultural exchange has been incredible. And actually two of those super talented boys joined the ABT school. And one of them is now also in the ABT studio company. So I to mentor that. these two boys from the Philippines, uh, has been incredible. To have that kind of connection to the country of my heritage is really special to me. Yeah, it, it's it's just to hear you talk. It is. Um, it, I have. I am not someone who's been that connected to my cultural heritage, and I want to be able to connect more. And so, don't be surprised if I start asking you questions on how to, how can I? What's the best way? Um, and I think you're, you're just hearing your, your, you're talking, it's, it's so powerful, all the work you've done. And it's very clear that like your cultural heritage has informed not only, not only your work artistically, but just, but just what you want to give back, what your, what your legacy is beyond the stage. It's, oh, thank it's you. really, really wonderful. That's very kind. Um, and it's actually, and it's, it's super refreshing to hear. This is not a perspective that we always get to highlight in our dance world. Um, so I am super excited that you're being so open with all of this. Um, so the next question I have on my little list is, how do you think the ballet world is doing in terms of the macro sense of race and representation? Um, I feel as though I can only speak to my own circle, you know, to speak from an informed perspective. I, I, I haven't been privy to spending a lot of time in the whole, in all the different ballet companies. So I don't know if I can speak to the whole ballet world, but my ballet world, <laughs> um, I, I feel really happy to say that, um, ABT has been a really great reflection of the diversity that I see in America. So 
again, speaking to the ballet world that I know that I, that I have been deeply embedded in, I, I, I see, I think that they're doing as well as, as we can uh, in the time frame that, that we've had. So of kind of piggybacking off of that question in seeing other ballet companies dance or in seeing um, different shows, different artistic ex- expressions in our, in your, in your life in New York, like, have you had any experiences um, with yellow face that in which you were made to feel uncomfortable that you'd feel comfortable sharing? And there's no pressure here. If you can't think of anything off the top of your head, that's not, I would say that any any kind of feelings of discrimination I have felt have been from outside of the ballet world. And the ballet world has actually been, for me personally speaking, has been a safe place. So, for example, ABT is a touring company. We've toured all over the world, many different, the most glamorous cities, and then the tiny towns, all awesome to experience, and all with um, appreciative audiences who love the art form or being are open to learning about it. Um, sometimes there were cities where I felt that being Asian was, uh, it was just a vibe <laughs> pretty much. It's hard to articulate. I, I feel really, I'm so fortunate to have never experienced any hateful um, racism or violence or um, any outward uh, racism, it, so to speak. But the vibe I'm talking about uh, is just like the type of stares that make you make you feel like maybe you don't belong in a place. Sometimes I would feel that way, leaving the theater and going for dinner somewhere in a, in a town that I was not familiar with, in a, in a place where I was the only one who looked like me. <laughs> um, and that's where I would get, feel the vibe and feel the stares. And all I would have to do is go back to the theater and, and um, feel at home again. So, so I feel really lucky in that regard. Right. But thank you for sharing that. And I just want to highlight that it is so we are such perceptive, perceptive beings, especially us as women. And, And it can even take as little as a vibe. It doesn't have to be something that's blatantly violent. God forbid that that happened to anyone. I mean, unfortunately it does, but sometimes it all of it takes is a vibe to make someone feel like they don't belong. Just like you said, it's very eye opening for you to share that for everyone right now. So thank you for, for doing that. I know that your sister obviously wanted to get you into dance, but um, how did your parents feel about you going into a professional creative um, career? It was definitely a different uh, departure for them. Um, they, my father, uh, he's now retired, but he's a civil engineer, and um, my mother's a homemaker. Um, but they were very much of the mentality that I should pursue um, a higher academic career and and become a profession that is not a ballet dancer (laughs) anything that was not that (laughs) but they did support uh, my taking lessons they saw that I absolutely fell in love with it 
My mother was an absolute champ, picking me up from school every day with snacks and driving me to ballet class, waiting for me in the car for hours to do ballet class and rehearsal and then driving me home. I mean, that kind of support is so, it's so hardcore. (laughs) And um, I'm so grateful for that. That being said, of course, they wanted me to go to follow a conventional route to go to college and pursue a a different career. Um, My mom and I got a sim got had the same pace as far as like learning about the fact that being a ballet dancer was a an actual profession. You know, this is obviously pre internet. And um, so we'd go to the library and check out all these videos. um, And she started to see, you know, I was obsessed with Marco Fontaine and and that video of Baryshnikov at the Met doing um, Don Quixote and seeing what big ballet companies uh, were all about. was really fun, obviously, for me as a kid to learn about, but it was also an education for my mom. And so I think when I find, when I told them when I was maybe 15 that I really wanted to pursue a a career in dance, they, they were hesitant, but um, I feel like they maybe didn't think it was going to happen. They were just like waiting for me to do the conventional route eventually. <laughs> but little did they know that when I was 17, I'd be able to join ABT and um, yeah. So I think it it all happened really fast for them. And luckily they were very supportive. And once they started coming to the ABT shows and seeing that I was one living, living out, my dream, but also able to support myself. And, um, you know, who knew Uh, ballet dancers have um, health benefits and um, can pay their own rent and don't have to have five jobs. And like, just like all the myths that people would say about dancers, Um, they're very supportive even though I think it took them by surprise. Right. And it's also, it's, I think it also probably keyed into how much work you put into that. So they saw how dedicated you were. And it's very clear that you've, you've gone above and beyond. And like you have this beautiful mind. Had you gone a, a traditional higher education route, like I feel like you would be doing somewhat of the same things you are right now. This is like just a very special a, time for me to get to speak with you so um the next question I want to ask is like it's what kind of what advice advice is such a trendy word but what would you want to say to a young dancer who's looking to have this career in dance knowing what we what we know Mm -hmm. yeah um I think, I think you know how hard uh, a career in ballet will be when, when you are bitten by the bug, like what we were talking about before, when, when it, you absolutely don't question the fact that you're going to train and train and train and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and constantly try to perfect that step every single day until you perfect it. And then you, the next day you want to perfect it even more. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain, it takes a certain, um, a person of a certain ilk uh, to pursue this career. I think I think you just know you're going to pursue it with all your heart um, as soon as you decide you're going to do it. 
that being said, so much of luck and timing and having the stars all align and having um, the courage and stamina to persevere through all kinds of challenges, just like everyone in life and every vocation, um, there are challenges, but, you know, just speaking personally, and I, I think almost every single dancer, professional dancer will talk about how injury is a challenge um, that is faced by almost every dancer um, and, and conquered, mm. hopefully. Um, there are different ways to look at it. If, if you don't come back from an injury, you definitely learn some amazing, valuable lesson from some, that experience. Um, often people do come back from injuries and also learn from the experience. As far as advice, I, this is really hard because it's hard to give advice after uh, experiencing all that we've experienced you know, over the years. You kind of want to just let the dancer go through their experiences and face the challenges because that's the way you learn and grow and become the person and dancer and artist that you will become. Um, so I think once you become a dancer, no matter how young you are, when you know that you're going to become a dancer, you're already, you already have the, the thought that you're going to go the distance. So saying to a young dancer to uh, persevere and, and, and work hard is, is kind of uh, unnecessary. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to say is that I support you. That's what I would say. Everyone's experience is going to be different. And I'm going to say that whatever you learn and what, however you persevere through something to get to your dream is absolutely worth it. Yeah. I, you so. answered that beautifully. You said everything in that and that this is this is the great love and great love does not come without great loss and great love does not come without great struggle and 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 it, and it is like i it's you you know that you're committed to that and that's what it takes and and you also just hit on the fact that like every single person's career is completely different and just because your career or your path doesn't necessarily look like anyone else's that has come before you or has, or has since been it that doesn't necessarily count you out and it doesn't necessarily guarantee you a spot either so you it's really so exactly thank you that's exactly the summation that i that i needed to say <laughs> no you, you put you it just beautifully you, you are you, know, you, articu you articulated it already i'm just echoing it because i think it's so important for everyone to let that sink in and digest these beautiful words that, that this this wisdom that's coming that from you right now i'm so excited that you are an artistic director and this brings me to my last question Aww. and it's like this is probably going to be and that no one's going to hold you to this to this answer and i think this is going to be ever evolving and you haven't even uh, we haven't even had a chance to transition yet but like i think you have two different differing distinct points like from a dancer point of view and from a now an artistic director point of view what do you think or what are some ideas that you're percolating um that you think we need to expand upon to build a loyal, uh, younger-based and and 
most importantly, a more inclusive audience for dance? Yeah, I mean, it seems like we're already on the right track. I think with all of social media's um, faults, it yeah. also has uh, been a really amazing way to um, make ballet accessible to as to many more people than than ever before. If all the elementary schools were able to go see a ballet, how amazing would that be? Or to go um, take ballet class every week, like the the Centex kids in Manila. The fact that so many of them are talented ballet students is mind blowing to me. And yet they come from these really disadvantaged, um, economically disadvantaged homes. Um, so it's just, Finding the way, finding the resources, which is always really hard, especially in America, um, to give access to arts education. Um, so that is one solution for sure. Just making people, educating people and the younger generation, the kids, let them try a plie and a saute and a glissade and get it in their body and so they can see what it takes see how hard it is and um when they see ballet on tv or on instagram then then they can relate to it better yeah but if it's just so distant then it's harder it's harder to to draw them in this access and access, especially to children with their minds so open. I had to give a pre-performance speech before one of my, uh, before the last, the last show that we actually had, I had in the season, it was a school show. And I was like, what, what am I going to, I don't, these kids don't, they don't understand Balanchine. They don't understand Jerome Robbins. This is like their first foray to, to the theater. So it was like, what is magical about it? And I, I think they're, they're away from school and then they're being told they need to like experience this in a, I didn't want them to feel like they had to experience it in one way. They didn't have to love it. And I just was like, hey, there's no wrong way to experience the ballet. You might look to your neighbor and they, they might be completely moved and enthralled and you might not be. And that's totally fine. But maybe the next ballet you'll like better and you're, you know, like, and they totally resonated with it. And I think it's just, I think it's changing this sort of perception that like ballet is for the elite and the posh. It, it's definitely not, it's for dance, is for, dance in general is for everyone. And that yeah. um, you, you definitely hit upon all of those in your answer. So that's basically it, Miss Stella. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you so much for um, being my special guest today. And thank you viewers for tuning in. Um, I just want to make sure you guys check out the Instagram right now to see who's the reveal for tomorrow. And um, the next chat will be at noon Eastern Standard Time. And Stella, I, I'm in awe. Thank you very much. <laughs>